Hello everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to be here again in Copper Mountain. Um, yeah, my talk is about discretization of elliptic equations uh, using sparse grids and pre wavelets uh, I suppose that most, maybe most of you don't know a lot about sparse grids, I don't know, but it, I think it's important to recall what that is. And sparse grids was an idea which came up by Zenger uh, to discretize partial differential equations. And you all know what a full grid is. A full grid has n points in one direction and then n in the other direction. So in 2D you have n power 2 grid points and in 3D you have n power 3 and in 4 you have n power 4 and so on and you see when you really go to high dimensions uh, you will have big problems solving a PDE. And that the interesting property now of sparse grids is that the number of unknowns does not increase in such a dramatic way. You can see when d is dimension, we only have n and then logarithm n power d minus 1 uh, grid points. And the reason for that is the, the structure of sparse grids. So in the middle of the domain you have only n points. Then in the upper half n by 2, in the lower part n by 2. And that recursively goes on. So when you add that up you have n plus 2 times n by 2, 4 times n by 4. So you see you get a logarithmic term. And in other dimensions you get logarithmic terms as well. So the interesting thing is now when you, you can interpolate functions just by using b-linear functions, tree-linear functions that would be very often used when we solve PDEs. And when you use such b-linear or tree-linear functions or multilinear functions, then uh, the interpolation arrow is roughly the same as when we would have a, a, a full grid. Of course, functions have to be smooth enough to this end, but if functions are smooth enough, the interpolation error is nearly the same. So we have a much less grid points, but nearly the same error. So the important question was now, how can we solve PDEs? And there are two techniques. One is the combination technique, the other one is the Galakian approach. The combination technique is very simple to implement, but it has a very strong requirement. Uh, for the solution, a very strong smoothness requirement, and that's the reason why you cannot make it adaptive. And th that's it, it's not a very useful method for general PDEs, and that's a reason why a lot of people were interested in the so-called Galakian approach. And Zenger, uh, Bungert, and Balder at the beginning started with that, and they wanted to solve. PDEs in an adaptive way on sparse grids. So we, this method would be a method where we, you can also make an adaptive refi refinement when you have a singularity and in some parts functions not so smooth. Yeah, uh, but before I explain what kind of difficulties we get when, when I do that, I think it's important to know, okay, what is now the finite element space we are using? Yeah? Um, in 2D, we can use, for example, just piecewise b-linear functions, as you all know. Uh, and that, that would be, for example, the support of a very coarse piecewise b-linear function. And then you refine it in, in x directions. Then you would have here piecewise b-linear function with such a support. And you can refine those in the other direction. And then you would get uh, such a uh, function with such a very long uh, support And you can refine here in the middle too, but you would not refine in that area where you would have a full grid. Yeah? And then when you overlap all these grid points, you see you get this pattern. So in this finite, the finite element space you use in the Galakian approach, it's just a space spanned by functions of this support. So the main idea of this function is you should not refine in x and y, you should only refine so that either one of them is very fine, but not in both directions. Yeah, so what is now the difficulty in solving PDEs? The difficulties are so-called overlapping basis functions. What is an overlapping basis function? You can see when you take, for example, this basis function uh, on that one, they are overlapping, which means uh, 
Yes, they overlap in this way, but here inside is no grid point. We have no uh, discretization point. And the difficulty is now to calculate A of V, P, V, Q. So that's what somehow you have to compute when you want to build out a stiffness matrix. Or at least implicitly, you have to be able to handle that value. And if you would have a full grid, then you can calculate VP, VQ from these two basis functions because you make also a causing or prolongation. Somehow you get the connection between cause and finer points by prolongation correction. But here we have no fine grid point, so here's no grid point inside, so we have a difficulty. And in particular, when we have variable coefficients, we have difficulties because the number of data we have here is already O of n squared, so we have a lot of data, and when we would all compute them, we would lose all our benefits from sparse grids. Okay, so what to do? So let us a little bit look back to the history of sparse grids. Then we see, okay, the first discretization were all discretization for constant coefficients. And what uh, Zenger and Balder and Bader at that time find out a very tricky way to calculate these values in an efficient way and to evaluate matrix vector multiplication in an efficient way. For constant coefficient, they found a very nice method. Then later there was the uh, concept of so-called semi-orthogonality, which I will explain to you more, in more detail later. And when you have this method at that time, that's nearly 20 years ago, um, you get a very nice conversion theory. You get a very nice method. It's not too difficult to implement. You have a very nice multigrid algorithm. And everything is fine, with the exception that it works only in 2D. Well, you want to have sparse grids in 3D and higher dimensions, maybe. So that was nice, but it was only something which worked in 2D. And that's the reason why other people came up with other concepts. And, but what you can say, the other concept has also some diffi difficulties. One of them was they were all non-symmetric for symmetric problems. That somehow shows there's something not going in the right way. Uh, second, there was no proof of conversion. It was very hard, difficult to analyze for these other methods to, to show that they really work. And this, the only proofs were something like simulation results in 3D for variable coefficient, but never something for 4D. I couldn't find something for 4D. And there were really serious problems in getting a and finding a good, fast, multi-grid algorithm. Maybe that's also the reason why now in this year comes up a new uh, article in CISC uh, about a multi-grid algorithm for sparse grids, but again for constant coefficient. Because handling variable coefficients in sparse grids is a serious problem. It's not so, yeah, there were some problems. So my talk now is about exactly these questions. How can we handle sparse grids variable coefficients. And the idea is you shall only have to use pre-wavelets. If you do that, then everything is fine. A very simple question, answer. So what are pre-wavelets? Maybe some don't know. First of all, have a look to standard piecewise linear function in 1D. That's a coarse grid function. And these are fine grid hat functions. And now when you look to this bilinear form here with derivatives, you, you, oh, everybody, most of you might know, okay, these functions are orthogonal to each other with this H1 semi bilinear form. So when you take derivative of this function, you get one minus one and here one, so we integrate, you get zero. So what is a pre-wavelet? A pre-wavelet is now a function with a similar property, but it has an L2 orthogonality property. So when you take this function here, multiply it with that one, a coarse grid function, and integrate, you would get zero. So a pre wavelet function is somehow a function which a little bit of larger supports than these hat functions, but they are L2 orthogonal. At the end, you get the same fine element space in, in 1D and so but it's just a little bit of a different function, which is L2 orthogonal. So the interesting property is now the following. When we look to this uh, bilinear form with here a constant coefficient, let's start with that, 
And we look now to these overlapping functions. I told you, the overlapping functions are this is what is difficult to compute in, in Sparsquid, to calculate how one overlapping function is related to the other. That's a difficult thing. So uh, now what you can prove is that the value of a of b p q is zero. Yeah, when it's zero, we don't have to compute anything. Then it's easy. But only when we are in 2D and have a constant coefficient and use hat functions. But when we use pre-wavelets, then it doesn't matter what kind of dimension we have, you all the time get zero. So that's the big advantage, and that's also the reason why this discretization I showed you here in 2D worked only in 2D because hat functions are only have this property only in 2D for C cos zero. But when you use pre wavelets all the values which are difficult to compute are zero. So we don't have to compute anything. Yeah. So now what we do we do in case of variable coefficients? We use the idea of semi-orthogonality, the discretization of semi-orthogonality. And what is this uh, concept saying? It's saying the following. When you have a bilinear form like that, and you have difficulties computing A of V, P, V, Q for overlapping functions, just put it zero. So we don't, you know, that was difficult to compute. We could put zero if we have a variable coefficient. So we define a new bilinear form, which is a modification of the old one, by saying it's the same if we don't have overlapping function, and it should be zero if we have overlapping functions. Yeah? So we made a so-called variational crime. But you know, var variational crimes are not so dangerous, <laughs> like usually crimes are, because there's a big theory uh, in mathematics showing that variational crimes might not be really something very dangerous. And that's what we have to prove later, that this variation crime is not a serious crime. Okay, and then the discretization we get is this kind of discretization, you know, just what we would do when we have a fine element approach. Uh, let me first show you an interesting impact on implementation. The interesting impact is when, when you want to solve really a, a, a PDE, um, then this overlapping functions also lead to difficulties when you want to really solve the linear equation system because you have to handle a lot of values. But when you have the same orthogonality, then everything is much easier because all the, all the overlapping values are zero, so you don't have to take them into account. So the multigrid algorithm you can use then is a so-called Q cycle. What means Q cycle? It's just a semi coarsening cycle. You know, here this scheme here shows the grid very fine in y direction, here in x direction, and it's a scheme which is also doing a lot of semi coarsening and it's doing a lot of V cycles in y direction and x direction. That's it. And it starts here at the same point as it ends. And there's the formulas you have to use here in semi coarsening you can derive completely from the 1D case. You don't have to take into account anything overlapping. You just um, derive the formulas you have to you use for restriction prolongation for the 1D case. And you do also use pre wavelets only in the direction where you restrict. So you don't have to use pre wavelets in all directions. Only in the direction where you restrict, you use the pre wavelets. You can also do the relaxation only with standard basis function, if you like to, and then switch to pre wavelets in the direction you are causing as soon as you want it causing. So from uh, computation amount, that's also not too bad. So there's only one big difference, which you might, should remember, between a multi-grid algorithm and full grid and sparse grids. And that has to do with some restriction and prolongation. You all know you never would prolongate a right hand side, right? You would restrict the right hand side and you would prolongate the approximate solution. But nobody comes to the idea to prolongate the right hand side. Why should we do that? We know the right hand side on the fine grid. But that's now something we have to do on sparse grids. You, you make a causing of the right hand side and you have to do a prolongation of the right hand side where you use exactly the same formula but just change, put, change a little bit. 
Yeah? And the reason is you have to pull it right hand right side because you have some change values from the other direction that you have to take into account. So well, that's the main difference between multigrid from um, full grid and sparse grid. So now let's go to theory. I hope I have still have some time. Uh, I think I have some time. So good. So okay. Now let's go to theory, which certainly makes a lot of fun to show that the variation crime is not a big crime. Uh, first, let us see what kind of conversions we get when we apply semi coarsening for constant coefficient. Let's say constant coefficient. What that would be. That, then, in principle, you get the standard convergence theory, which is uh, uh, not well known for sparse grid. The computation amount for solving the linear equation system is something like O of power, h power minus 1 with some logarithmic terms. So these dots mean there are some logarithmic terms. So you have, don't have a very high computation amount in solving the linear equation system. Yeah? But the error in H1 now is in the same, roughly in the same range as you would have in a full grid. It's O of h. This is what, what you have. So that's the same thing for uh, what you usually have in the past case. But the same ordinality here is something you get for free because you're using pre wavelets. So what happens now if we really have a variable coefficient? And the analysis takes some time. It's some time to prove it. Uh, let's first start first with this case, so when we have a Helmholtz term, and see is here a variable coefficient and it's smooth enough, then we can show we get the same order of conversions until order four. Yeah? But when you go to higher orders, then the Rayshon crime makes, has some influence. And it, I think it's, it's not a too bad, it's a, it's, it's a good, somehow it's a good message that the Rayshon crime really plays a role because if we really have a very high dimensional problem and to solve it in an extremely fast way, uh, even for variable coefficient, that would be great, but it's that with such a simple method, I think we can be very happy about this result. Even when you think about the half year conversions, H1 on which is H power one half, uh, when you have only so less grid points, it, it's really great when you have that in, in, in dimension six. Yeah. So, uh, okay, another thing I also recently wrote down a, in, a, in a proof, but I only have to say on a piece of paper. But I think it, it works out fine. We can also prove uh, if this coefficient here is variable, if the principal part is variable. Um, and the, I have to say, proofs need some time really to do in this case, because some, some things are then a little bit a little bit difficult, but one can do it. And then we can also show this optimal convergence until dimension three. For dimension four, higher, I don't know. I need some time. We just need some time to do all the analysis and find out what's really going on in higher dimensions. But let me, uh, I think I still have some time. Let me briefly tell you how the proof works. So what we have to show is that the variation of crime is not a too big crime. That's what we mainly have to, to prove. So what we typically have to show is that the bilinear form we were defining, and it's different to the original one, is small, oh sorry, is small, that means we have such an estimate, and this term here, uh, yeah. And it, it's something like O of H. Let's say O of H, but depending on dimension, it's a little bit different. It's something like O of H. And what is this difference? This difference is just this term when we have this Helmholtz term. We're not talking only about a variable Helmholtz term. So we have the integral, uh, this variable coefficient here, and then that's the estimate we have to do for overlapping functions. Only for overlapping functions we have to do that. OK. Um, the difficulty now is we have really precisely to define what means an overlapping function. In 2D, I showed you this picture, but when we go to, uh, oh no, I will tell you that later. Oh no, let me, let me go back. Okay, here, we have to show that this is small, and the idea is the following. Um, 
we want to show that this is small and the idea is the following. When you put in here a piecewise constant function, then by the, the case that we are using pre wavelets here, we would get zero. So what we have to put in here, we can put in a function, a suitable uh, interpolation function, which interpolates constant in certain direction, only in those directions, where the levels in P and Q are different, and then you can get this estimate. And uh, for doing that in detail, you have to know what are uh, overlapping functions. And to this answer, let me, let me show you that all this analysis goes at the end to some playing around with numbers. That's at the end was a tricky part. You have to deal with numbers and with integer numbers. And let me explain you to why that is the case for the analysis. So when you have this path grid, then each of these basis functions we can associate some levels or depth. We can say, okay, this function, for example, is on the level two zero. That function is on the level zero two, and that's on the level one one. Yeah? And then we'd have to do the following formal definition. Two basis functions are overlapping. We say two basis functions are overlapping if, first of all, they're contained in this path grid. That means, um, oh, here's a power D missing. Uh, that's what I forgot. As T should be here a vector of, of uh, levels of uh, power d, and when you add up all these levels, it should be small equal to one, that means we have a function in this path grid, but the maximum of both should be larger than n. So uh, remember that uh, these are both vectors uh, of dimension d, and then we need the following really technical lemma. So what we have is we have vectors corresponding to levels. So level one, level two, level three, and so on. And these vectors, here yeah, I have written it correctly, these vectors satisfy, must satisfy certain properties that they come from overlapping functions. Then we look to those uh, dimensions where these vectors are not equal, and then we have to show such an estimate. But this estimate, it has nothing to do with, un, let me say, with double spaces. It's just playing around with numbers. And then you can also get counterexamples. For example, let me make the following example. Say, let's say you have two functions, and one is on level one, zero, two by three, minus one, two by three, two by three. And the other one is on zero, one, two by three, two by three, two by three. That's in dimension five now. When we have these integers, we can first of all see, when we add up that one by three, one by three, and here, we get something smaller, one. So it's related to a sparse grid. That's also related to a sparse grid because adding up gives only one uh, n. But when you take maximum, you see we get something larger n. Because, oh, sorry. Because here we have zero, one, maximum gives one, one, zero, maximum gives one. So that's related really to a problem. Uh, to, uh, to These are overlapping functions, but they are overlapping in such a way um, that the maximum here of these values and that values is only n by three, and that's the reason. Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, okay, my summary is now, <laughs> sorry. Uh, my summary is now, we can discretize partial differential equations, uh, even on 3D in a very efficient way, on higher dimensions very efficient way, with path grids and variable coefficients when we use um, semi orthogonality and pre -validates. these are the important properties, that's very important. And that makes the algorithms easier. We only have to implement 1D dimensional formulas and we get out the very nice conversion theory. Thank you very much. <laughs>